Okay, it is 9 a.m. Eastern, so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone who is joining us live this morning, and hello to those of you watching the recording. Uh, I am Caitlin McLemore. I am an instructor with EdTech Teacher. I'm joining you from Tampa, Florida today, uh, and I have almost 10 years of experience as an educational technology coach at private schools in the Tampa Bay area and also in the Nashville area as well, working with kindergarten through 12th grade students and teachers to integrate technology into the classroom. I am now an instructor with EdTech Teacher and our focus today is on building traditional and creative assessments with Google Workspace for Education. So that will be our focus. I am a Google Certified Innovator and Trainer as well. So if you have any Google questions, please let me know. Uh, feel free to participate in the chat, asking questions and sharing your ideas and thoughts. Uh, and then also there will be opportunities for you to ask questions if you want to unmute your mic. Either way is fine, however you feel most comfortable participating. Uh, but we will go ahead and get started. Lots to cover today. Uh, first, we will look a little bit at defining assessment. What does assessment look like, particularly in thinking about assessment in the digital age and how technology has maybe shifted assessment, then we'll look at Google Forms as a an assessment tool and how you can use Google Forms for assessment. Then we'll look at some creative assessments, how you can uh, both grade creatively and use uh, project based learning uh, and, and some of the technology tools you can use to facilitate creative assessments. And then we'll do a final reflection. So we have a lot to cover in the next hour. I'll put the uh, link again in the chat for you all to follow along. Are there any questions before we get started? Okay, well, continue saying hello and good morning and introducing yourselves. Uh, and we will move on and feel free at any point, of course, to add uh, any questions to the chat. But we'll start by redefining assessment. So I'd like to ask you all a question, a discussion question to get us started. So how do you define assessment? And the way I'd like for you to answer this question is in the chat, create a hashtag describing your definition of assessment or how you use assessment in the classroom and share that in the chat. So I'll give you just a few moments to uh, think through that hashtag and then to share in the chat. I'm already seeing some hashtag understanding. Show me what you know. Measure what students know and understand, gauging mastery. So a lot about determining student understanding, student knowledge, measurement of mastery, what you know, where we go. Ah. Inform where we go, guiding future learning. Did I get it right? <laughs> so there's some measurement involved and you're measuring student understanding, student mastery, student progress, using it to inform and teaching and learning. This would be an interesting exercise in a word cloud too. <laughs> what did you not understand? Assessing feelings. So not only what students know or understand about a topic, but how they feel about it. What I got, I like that one, it's catchy. Okay, keep them, keep them coming where we're, <laughs> Where are we in the lesson? Uh, yes, feel free to continue sharing your hashtags, but I'm seeing a lot of 
measurement, assessing where students are, what they know, think, feel, understand, uh, measuring their progress, measuring their feelings, having students explain what they understand. Uh, so lots of measurement and lots of student-centered uh, definitions of assessment. So this is just a general question to think about in defining assessment. And of course, you know, everyone has their own definition and what assessment looks like in your classroom depends on you and your learners and your context and, and, and many different factors. But generally speaking, the idea of assessment is have students met the desired learning goals and outcomes and to what extent. And so the, the digital age has impacted, you know, our, our ubiquitous use of technology has really impacted how we define assessment. So it used to be that assessment was uh, very, very concrete and focused on filling in the blanks or filling in this bubbling in those circles with a pencil. Uh, but now there's so many different ways that we can measure student progress and knowledge and understanding and feelings uh, using technology tools. Uh, so instead of just thinking about assessment uh, of learning, we can also think of assessment as a learning experience and also think about a, assessment uh, of, of the learning process or while learning. So assessment of, as, and while learning talks about assessment as uh, measuring the product, the process, and the progress. And all of these slides also have uh, links to articles and some research supporting these concepts of assessment and digital assessment. So if we think about assessment for learning, uh, assessment for learning can facilitate deeper personalized learning. So students know very, very deeply what it is that they understand and what it is that they still have to learn. Uh, and it really helps foster student agency over learning. If they're part of that, um, if they're using the assessment to learn, then they're, they're able to take ownership of that learning process. And it creates more equitable learning environments and thinking about uh, what it is that students need uh, and making sure that all students get what they need uh, to be successful. The assessment for learning project talks about five core shifts in assessment, and I do recommend checking out this website if you are interested. So they have five core shifts of assessment uh, and thinking about assessment in the digital age and thinking about student centered assessment. Uh, so these five core shifts really focus on instead of being an isolated experience, it's integrated into the learning experience. And then instead of just a summative evaluation at the end of a, a lesson or unit, there's opportunities for feedback and reflection throughout the learning process. And then instead of, not that you can't grade, but instead of just having one final score, uh, there might be a body of evidence. So students aren't just, uh, having one test and then one numerical score and that's that's the entirety of their their uh, assessment and then instead of saying this is where the gaps are it's saying well we're using this assessment to inform where we need to support learners and then instead of it being a control process really thinking about a collaborative experience where the students are involved in that assessment either through self-reflection or peer feedback uh, so there's a a variety of ways that we can provide more student-centered uh, assessment experiences. I am going to uh, I'm going to mute everyone because I'm hearing some background noise. But if you do have any questions, please feel free to to unmute. Uh, just hearing those those clicks can be a little distracting. So uh, feel free to unmute or also to share questions in chat too. Uh, so now that we have our idea of assessment, what is assessment, how might we facilitate student-centered assessment, uh, we can look at some of the tools that will facilitate these student-centered assessments or learning experiences, or how we can use assessment to inform teaching and learning. So the, the Google tool that uh, is most connected maybe to uh, certainly traditional assessments, but we'll look at some other opportunities for uh, student-centered assessments and, and assessment throughout the learning process uh, is Google Forms. So 
I'd like to start by asking, start this section of our session by asking, what is your comfort level with Google Forms? And really thinking about the lens of Google Forms as an assessment tool. So if you're a new user uh, or you're very curious about Google Forms, one, and then five would be an expert user and you're super confident. So just a, a quick uh, check for the fives, twos, threes. Okay, two, three, four, five. Okay, we've got a, a range of folks here. No brand new users though. We're a year and a half into this. <laughs> But that's fine if you're if you're new or you're curious. Uh, we'll talk about some some tips and tricks for using Google Forms for assessments. And those of you that are more confident or expert users, please feel free to share your expertise as well. Uh, so we will. I'll I'll give an overview of Google Forms and talk about some of the potential of Google Forms as an assessment tool. And I'll do a little bit of live demonstration, uh, but in an hour, it's hard to get a, an in-depth uh, look into Google Forms, but we'll do sort of a highlight of uh, the ways that you can use Google Forms for assessments. And again, any of you that are more expert users, feel free to share your expertise in the chat. Uh, love hearing from classroom educators. Uh, about how you're using the tools in your classroom in your context. So I like to start when I bring up a tool with the what and the why, uh, just to really think about the meaning and purpose behind using a tool. So the what of Google Forms is Google Forms is a Google workspace for education tool where you can create custom quizzes and surveys. Uh, so it's free and it's web based. Uh, so anywhere that you're logged into your Google account, you can use uh, Google Forms or you can access your Google Forms. Um, and the why of using Google Forms over a different assessment tool, uh, well, that integration into Google Workspace is, is really key uh, because that allows you to uh, very easily post to Google Classroom if you use Google Classroom to collaborate with other educators, to share with your students, uh, and it lives within your Google Drive, so the organization piece is really helpful. And then you can also link your results to uh, Google Sheets for further data analysis. Uh, but even within, uh, within Google Forms, you can, uh, you can add multiple question types, you can include files, images, links, and videos within the form, and then also within specific questions. Uh, there's multiple sharing options, which we'll look at, and collaboration options. And then there's an instant summary of responses and a link uh, to, uh, again, you can link to Google Sheets. So yes, you can, uh, you can wipe out answers uh, from past years. Uh, so you, and you could, uh, what you could do is you could either erase them from the sheet or you could link your responsive sheet to a new uh, Google Sheets. But we can look at that as we get into the tool. Uh, so there's lots of different ways to create. Thank you. There's lots of different ways to create a new uh, Google form. You can create it from your Google Drive. You can go to forms.google.com and log in. If you're on a Chromebook, there's a sheet, there's a form app, uh, or if you're in Chrome, um, you can very easily use the uh, keyboard shortcut. So forms.new or form.new, if you type that into your address bar, uh, you can, uh, it will just create a new untitled form. So some other tips for reusing Google Forms, creating an, a copy in a new folder. Uh, so then that way you have old responses and you have a new uh, clean form to use with students as well. Uh, so that way you can make adjustments. So here we are within an untitled form. And uh, let's talk, we can talk through a little bit of that. So if you are using a, uh, if you are using a, let me see, are you, are you all still able to see my screen? Even though I'm not in full screen. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, maybe you're seeing some nice sailboats in the background. <laughs> uh, but if you are in a form and you want to copy it, 
If you are in the top right corner, there's three dots. That gives you some options. You can trash a form. I can't delete this form because I haven't actually done anything to it yet. Uh, so if you create an untitled form or any sort of untitled Google Doc or Sheets or whatever, if you don't do anything to it, it, it just doesn't, there's nothing to delete because there's no file there. So there's nothing to save. Uh, but if I came in and did my, uh, let's see if I titled it, I can then, you can see that it's saving. So in the top left corner, it tells you all changes are saved in Drive. Um, if I click into the untitled form here, it automatically will change the title. Uh, but as far as reusing forms, uh, if you go to the top right corner, again, you can, uh, you can make a copy and then that will be a clean, uh, that would be sort of a, a clean copy. So you might say this is, uh, from the 2021 school year. And then when you copy it over, uh, you might call this the 21, 22 school year. Uh, that way you uh, can adjust if you need to adjust any of the questions or you know uh, when you create a new responses spreadsheet that you, uh, which, which year it's for. Uh, so as you, as you can see, any form has a questions tab and a responses tab. So when you have responses, uh, they will generate here and then they'll, you can also create a spreadsheet uh, and you can create a new spreadsheet or you can select an existing spreadsheet. Uh, but let's first look at some of the question choices within a form. So, you can use the default is going to be a multiple choice. And then depending on the question that you ask, Google may add some suggestions. So this one is what day it is, is it today? Um, and Google knew to add in all of the days of the week. With any question, you can, uh, you can also add in other. Uh, you can duplicate the question too. So let's say you are asking students about vocabulary words or you're wanting to reuse the answers uh, for a question. Uh, you can duplicate it and then instead of having to type in all of the answers again, you can just change uh, slightly or slightly adjust the answers or slightly adjust the question. Uh, so if I could say, you know, what is my, what is your favorite day of the week? So it's all the same question or all the same answers, but it's a different question. And so I just had to type in the different question. Uh, again, you know, you can duplicate your least favorite. You can see that concept uh, of very easily duplicating some of your assessment questions. Uh, so uh, that that can be helpful. And then with any uh, with any question, you can see next to the question and next to each answer. When I hover over it, there are uh, uh, there, it looks like a little mountain in a square. That's the image icon. So I can actually add a an image to the question. So when I this is really helpful if you're doing something visual, like you're having uh, students um, label something or if you're having students um, choose a visual uh, description. So you might say, uh, what is the proper way to solve this equation? And then you could have the different types of uh, different ways to solve the equation as different answers. And then you could, it could be a drawing, it could be an image you found on the internet. It's also helpful for students in early, uh, early education, if they're you know, emerging readers, they may not know how to read the days of the week, but maybe uh, days of the week isn't maybe the best example, but let's say you're asking them about colors or something that has a visual form, you can also add a, a, an image as well. So if I, for this example, said, what is the least favorite day of the week? Uh, I could upload pictures, I could add a camera picture. So with the camera, you know, let's say I'm doing a sad face, I can insert that. Uh, and then it just inserts it in there. Uh, but let's say I wanted to, under favorite day of the week, uh, 
I could come in and you can also add by URL photos, Google Drive or Google image search. Uh, now, when you do a Google image search, it is not, um, those are not necessarily reviewed for uh, copyright uh, as far as uh, what the copyright, uh, whether or not those are copyright free images. If you are using an assessment with just your students for educational purposes, it's likely to be covered under fair use. So I'm not a, a copyright lawyer <laughs> by any means, uh, but generally if you're doing something for educational purposes and you're just sharing it with your students in your classroom, that's not gonna be a concern, but any, any forms where you were sharing it publicly or sharing it with your school, you know, your broader school community, I would be more mindful about uh, the images that you add. So either add images that you've created uh, or there are some other images, there's some copyright free images, uh, image sites that you could go to specifically and then download to your computer and, and kind of upload them that way. Uh, so you're welcome. That, that's my, my short answer on the copyright piece. Uh, but you can see this, uh, there's a variety of different ways that you can add pictures and then you can also add them in as, uh, as the answer choices as well. Uh, so this isn't really a great example, let's see. Uh, Unseals and Canva have copyright picks. Uh, Unsplash, oh, Unseals. <laughs> I, I was gonna say, I'm not familiar with that. Unsplash, uh, Pixabay is another one. Uh, that has copyright free images. Um, and then the noun project has copyright free icons. So those are some great websites to check as well. Uh, but you can imagine, are there, uh, if anybody who has used forms quite frequently, um, how might you, uh, how might you have used images in your forms before would be interested to know. Um, any any examples, classroom examples of, of how you, you've used images within your forms? So maps, yes. And that's a great point too. So you can, you can have them analyze a political cartoon. So it could be instead of a multiple choice, um, you're putting in an image and then having them do a free response Ooh, describing the mistake. I like that one. <laughs> uh, let's see, describing a graph or a figure, images as answers for non-readers, inserting math diagrams, images to support English language learners, uh, using your own pictures to show your work, uh, rating scale. Yes, we'll look at some of those options too how they're feeling about work. Uh, so that's a, a great segue into the next question type. Uh, we can look at the different question types. So the default when you add a new question is going to be multiple choice, uh, but there are a variety of question options as well. Uh, so we, you can um, under multiple choice, if you click on multiple choice, you can have a short answer, you can have a paragraph, uh, you can do check boxes drop down. Uh, linear scale, that's going to be the one. How did you feel about this assignment? So again, those of you that are talking about feelings and emotions, and that's really great for self-reflection. That's really great for you as well to evaluate you know, how challenging or easy an assignment was or how engaged students were. Uh, so that linear scale can really help gauge student interest, engagement, motivation. Uh, and then you can, yes, also use those um, question. You could say, you know, not great to grade. Uh, and then you can do anything from zero and one to, to 10. Uh, and you can add images to that as well. Some other question types that you can add. Uh, you can also, so any sort of short answer or paragraph that might be, um, you know, watch the video above and share your thoughts. So I'm seeing in the chat, the question about videos uh, or, or share you know, one detail from the video. Uh, 
So the way that you can add, you can also add, in addition to adding questions, um, you can add videos. And the videos do have to be uh, on YouTube. So if you've created a screencast in Loom or Screencastify, or in if you've recorded a Google Meet or Zoom, uh, you would need to post that to YouTube so that you could then uh, that you could then share it with students. Uh, so let's say we wanted to do, we wanted to find a video, uh, any video that's on YouTube, you can search for a video or you can uh, paste in a specific YouTube URL. So if you were using your own videos, um, you could, you could go to your own YouTube channel and, and you could copy in, or you can do an external YouTube search. Uh, so let's say, right, so you create in Loom or Screencastify or whatever recording tool you're using, post it to YouTube, make it private, but then uh, you can share via the link. Uh, so I'm not sure if I have anything. I don't have anything on this channel, uh, but any any video uh, you can, waiters always look at me, uh, go into and then you can uh, click share and then you'll have a link to copy it. Uh, and that should be true also of videos that are on your channel. You can uh, make it so it's private that only people with the link can view that video. Uh, but let's go back into our demo form uh, and you see if you paste in the video, um, then it will add it directly. Uh, you can also search for videos as well. So once you add that video in, uh, it will uh, add, add the video in sort of as a block within that form. And then you can see, you can click and drag anything around. So uh, I have this video and then it says, watch the video above and share one detail from the video. You could also say, uh, what is the name of the person in the video, for example. So you could ask multiple questions. Um, you know, depending on what it is that you're asking students to do. So you could do a, a quick check for understanding uh, to have some details from the video they have to answer questions on. Then you could also ask them to reflect. Uh, you could also ask those questions about uh, how they feel about an assignment. So, so videos are a, a great tool to, uh, you can add in a video to ask students questions, whether those are knowledge checks or uh, reflection questions or having them think about or connect or extend their learning to other uh, topics. So let me take a quick scan in the chat. Uh, yes, you can also copy a YouTube link from the address bar. Uh, by just clicking and dragging to copy or right click and copy link address as well. Oh, you're saying too, if you see it sort of like on another website um, where it's embedded, you might also be able to copy it that way. But yes, it does have to be a video on YouTube. Uh, now pictures, so with pictures, you have all of those variety of choices as far as Google image search, your own Google Drive, your Google Photos, if you have Google Photos um, by URL, your own camera and then uploading as well. So there's there's a lot more choices as far as uh, adding a picture. Uh, but some of you shared in the chat your examples. So you might have uh, you might have a map uh, and then you might say, have a, a series of questions after that. So, what is the farthest, uh, what is the state on the far right on the image? So you might have questions that are related to the map and you might have multiple questions. Um, so which state uh, is, you know, you, you would ask them questions to, uh, about the, the map. You could also take this image or you could take an image that you have and in, a, in an image editing 
software. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of giving out some ideas today. Don't have uh, time to necessarily demo all the tools, but just this is more sort of idea generation that hopefully you can apply to your own context. But for example, if you have a, a map, you could put it into other image editing software, uh, you know, maybe Canva, maybe just some the whatever is um, the default image editing software on your computer uh, and add in some labels as well. So you might label different states with A, B, C, D, and then you could say what state is Texas. And then you, know, you might have an, a, a label on top of that and it could be A, B, C, D. And you could say, um, let's duplicate this and say what state is Florida. And then you could duplicate it and say what state is Washington. Uh, and then they're using that labels that you sort of overlay on top of that image. You could, um, which you could do in Google Drawings, for example, if we're thinking about Google Workspace tools, um, you could import an image of a map and then add uh, in labels for different places that you want them to uh, address. And then um, they would answer a series of questions related to that image. But I, I saw a variety of different uh, examples of using images in a question or in a survey or a quiz. Uh, now, we've got a lot of random questions in this demo. <laughs> uh, but what you can do to sort of break up a uh, break up a form. So if I click on the eyeball, I can preview this form and see, oh, it's you know, it's just a big long scroll. Uh, I can come in and I can add in a title and description. So let's see where it added it. Uh, it added it down here. So I could say, uh, add this title and description, and this could be video reflection. And this would be the, this set of questions relates to a video, there will be comprehension questions and reflection questions. And then let's say I'll bring that click and drag to bring that up. And so we've got our video, we've got a reflection question, we've got a multiple choice question. Now, if I add in another title, uh, another title block, I can also say, this is the map question. Uh, these questions are related to maps. So you can see when I preview this again, uh, there's just sort of a text block that breaks up the content. Uh, you can also break up content using sections. So if I come down below, we've got add question, you've got add title and description, add image, add video. We also at the bottom have uh, add a section. Uh, so then you can, instead of having those text blocks, uh, you can have a, a completely different section. So this would be map questions. Uh, and then I could come down here and say maybe uh, add a section in between. And then this is feelings or this is reflection. So then when I preview this, uh, quiz, you can see there's my first set of questions. When I click next, it shows me my map questions. And then when I click next, it shows me my reflection questions. Uh, so that's just another way to break up your content as well. So let's see, we've got some questions in the chat, how to embed links to different sections. Ah, that's a great question. I, I do have some information on that. Uh, let's, let's finish up this uh, introduction piece, and then um, I'll I'll speak to the different sections uh, task. So if you have a title like that, but select random question order, it would it would keep the title in this. It should keep the title in the same place. Now, if you have sections, it would randomize within the section too. Uh, so for those of you that are maybe less familiar with um, Google Forms, this might be a good opportunity to look at some of the setting, some of the, the settings 
for questions. So within a question, you can make it required. So that forces students to answer that question before they submit. You can also um, shuffle the option order uh, and you can, uh, so that would say that, you know, Monday wouldn't always be first. Uh, if you go into the settings for the entire quit or the entire survey, so those are going to be in that little gear icon in the top right, uh, you can automatically collect emails, you can restrict to people just in your school or district, uh, you can also turn that off. Uh, you, if you limit to one response, it will require them to sign into their Google account, but it won't uh, re require them to be signed into their school Google account. And then you have some choices for what respondents can do if they can edit after they submit or see a summary. Uh, then as far as random questions, that would be under presentation. I'm not, I'm not really sure why it's under presentation, but uh, that's where you can shuffle the question order. And then if you have multiple uh, sections, the progress bar is here as well. Uh, and then if you want them to be able to submit multiple responses, you can. There is a new feature in Google Forms that uh, you it will auto save your responses. So if a student is taking a quiz or a survey on Google Forms and their browser closes for whatever reason, if they were logged into their Google account, it will automatically save all of their answers, even if they haven't hit submit. You can turn that off, though. You can disable auto save for respondents if you have a need for that. Now, if we're thinking about assessments, uh, you can make Google Forms a quiz. And so if you make a Google Form a quiz, you can assign point values to questions and allow auto grading for certain questions. So questions like multiple choice, uh, check boxes or drop down, some of those check box and drop down uh, or multiple choice matrix, you can also auto grade, though that gets a little bit more complicated with the rows and columns. You can auto grade short answers, but it does not recognize misspellings unless you, uh, with a with any sort of fill in the blank, you have to say all of the responses that you're, you'll accept as correct. So that can get a little bit tricky. Uh, and then does autosave work uh, in quiz mode? You can, you can, uh, you can let it autosave even if it's in quiz mode. Quiz mode just allows you to assign points and correct answers or incorrect answers. Uh, so it should still allow you to auto save. So I turned this into a quiz and you can see it, it, um, it still shows that uh, I'm logged into EdTech Teacher. Oh, locked quiz mode. That's a good question. So <laughs> locked quiz mode, if you have school issued Chromebooks, you can do locked quiz mode where it's sort of, uh, it's like a protected browser so they can't go to other websites or, or navigate to other uh, programs. Yes, they, they did fix that. I'm not sure exactly how they did, uh, but I, I was in a, a Google session where they, they talked about how they've addressed that issue where uh, students should not be able to click on the code to see the answers in quiz mode. Uh, so that should not be a problem any longer. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how they did it, but they, they have assured us that that sh should no longer be a concern. Uh, so <laughs> if we, uh, if we, just to review the the quizzes, it can auto grade short answer multiple choice check boxes drop down multiple choice grid and checkbox grid and then that locked mode feature is only for school managed Chromebooks at this point. Uh, so with any quiz question, you can see now that this quiz I went up to settings and I turned it on as a quiz um, now that this is a quiz. I can um, choose, the, if I click on answer key, I can choose the correct answer and I can assign it uh, as many points as I like. I can also add answer feedback. Uh, so that can be incorrect answers or correct answers, get uh, text-based feedback, or also you can add a link or you can add 
a YouTube video as well. So for example, if a student gets a question wrong, you could link to a video on YouTube that reviews that concept, or maybe you have students that get an extension question correct. Uh, they, you could link them to a website that has some additional challenges or problems for them to solve. Uh, and then you, uh, so you could say, uh, you know, review the following video and then here's a always review questions always review videos before you add them uh, so then you could add a link to let's say so then you as the teacher would see what uh, what your feedback was for correct and incorrect answers. Yes, any question that is short answer, you can manually review as well. And then for any long answer questions, you can also manually review. So for example, if I said is today, and then it was a short answer. Uh, if I come into the answer key, I could do Monday and mark all other answers as incorrect. Uh, but I could also, if I uncheck that, that means I can manually review. Uh, so if a student submits a um, an answer, I can grade it later on. So with a you can see with the paragraph there isn't a correct answer uh, so later on when students respond you would see that in the responses and you'd be able to to manually review and grade and get feedback there so that's that's a we've got a quick overview of some of the questions you can add some of the things you can add uh, some of the quiz settings and there was also a question in the chat about branching with forms so you can in addition to just creating sections to chunk your content you can also set it up where there are a variety of different sections uh, within a form and then depending on the student's answer uh, it will go to a different section so sort of like a choose your own adventure uh, it's called branching with forms so here is just a, a quick screenshot of what that looks like uh, but there's also a branching with forms example in the presentation, and I'll put this in the chat as well. Um, branching with forms can take, it, it's quite involved, so it's more than we can cover today. But I did want to share that resource with you and just give a, a brief description. So you can see here, it says, are you familiar with branched forms? If you say yes, then this form brings you straight to a challenge. Uh, but if you say somewhat or no uh, and click next, it will bring you to options for learning more about branching forms. So a blog post, a visual and written description, or a video. Um, and then when you click next, you can see it has the links here to those different resources. So if you are interested in learning how to build a branched form, definitely check out this example and it walks you through so you kind of experience it as a student. And then, uh, and then you can also review those resources as well. So any, uh, any questions about Google Forms before we move into creative assessments? I'm seeing something about creating an email based on a response. A student checks in the morning for SE means if they choose yes, they would create an email to specified staff. There, you could do that. I think you could do that with conditional formatting in your Google Sheets. Uh, are there, does anyone else have uh, suggestions or strategies for how you've managed that, that sort of process? Um. There is an option uh, to um, have it 
an email response. So if all of the counselors were editors on there, it might email them when there was a response. But in terms of just directly emailing a specific person, um, I don't know if there's a way to do that. But that might be a workaround that um, whenever there's a response, you, uh, the owner of the form at least would get an email and then you could look to and then forward that to the and reach out to the um, counselors. Does that make Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm going to look into the conditional formatting also. Right. So rather than it, it would be like a yes or no. Right. And then, yeah, because if, it, if it's daily and they get emails daily that just say they filled out a form, it, it doesn't have any meaning. The, the email will get overlooked. But then like if it's a yes, it should trigger a response. So. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll look into it. I just figured this is a place to ask, so. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Now, so you certainly can with conditional formatting, make it so that anybody who says yes, it would flag that as yellow. So, you know, in sheets, it will automatically populate any new responses as a new, um, as a new row, right? So you could say like in this column, if it's yes, then it turns bright yellow. So it's not automatically emailing them, but then you just have a quick sense of, okay, I can tell the counselor, well, 10 people said that they need help today, or that that's more of a, a quick pulse. Uh, but yes, you could also have, uh, you could share that spreadsheet. That That's a great uh, suggestion in the chat. You could share that spreadsheet with the person and then they could they could review to see who, who said yes in that column and get right, get an email notification that way. Uh, any other Google Forms as assessment questions, comments uh, before we move into our idea about creative assessments in our last 15 minutes? So creative assessments is a pretty broad idea or concept. There's a lot of ways that learners can demonstrate their knowledge and understanding. So we just did sort of a brief demo, you know, half hour demo of Google Forms showing you the different question types and thinking about ways you could use it as an assessment tool, both to demonstrate student understanding and also reflection about the, the assignment itself and reflection about the learning process. Um, and some of those quiz settings. But beyond just doing a, a quiz or a survey, you can also have learners demonstrate their knowledge and understanding using a variety of different creativity tools. So students could do creative writing, they could do multimedia creation through audio, uh, whether that's podcasting and something like SoundCloud or Sync uh, or video, if they're using iMovie or WeVideo or Movie Maker. Uh, multimedia presentation through things like Canva or Google Slides uh, or, you know, infographics where they're doing, uh, they're doing some, uh, some things like PictoChart, uh, but websites, that would be Google Sites, and then analog options where students are drawing things or making performances and then they're taking pictures or videos. Uh, so there's a variety of different creativity tools that you can use um, even beyond the, the Google Workspace piece. But of course, Google Workspace is a great place to sort of uh, house and document all of these things uh, because it's integrated and because it can all be sort of in one place. So I believe there's a, a session later today on digital portfolios uh, as far as you know, if students are making infographics or multimedia pre presentations or doing analog things or all of these external tools, they can all be sort of housed within digital portfolios, either in uh, Google Slides or on Google Sites as well. Uh, so I would definitely check that out. Uh, but if you want to uh, think about some additional ideas for integrating Google Workspace for Education, uh, 
as you use a variety of different analog or creativity tools to demonstrate understanding. Um, students can submit their learning artifacts using a Google form. So another option for a question type is file upload within a form. So if you have a file upload question, then students can upload PDFs, image, video files, audio files, a variety of different uh, file formats. And then you it will automatically create a folder in your Google Drive with all of those files. Uh, of course, if you're using Google Classroom, you can also have students submit a variety of file types as their uh, assignment when they're submitting an assignment. Uh, students can also share links to learning artifacts in a Google Doc reflection. Uh, maybe you're having, you have a, uh, if you're doing something where students are sharing with each other, you could have a class Google Doc and then have just a, a table where students are putting their name and then a link to their uh, whatever it is that they're creating. Um, and then you could also do digital portfolios and slides and sites, as I mentioned. Uh, now, how do you grade creative assessments? You can use rubrics to grade creative assessments. So rubrics provide clear indicators of learning objectives. It can be used regardless of what tool a learner uses to demonstrate mastery. So whether a student is creating a podcast or a documentary video or writing a creative essay, you can measure understanding of concepts in all of those different creative uh, creativity tools. So if you aren't used to using rubrics, a rubric describes the project or task and then includes the characteristics to be rated, the mastery levels, and then descriptions of each characteristic at the mastery level. Uh, so there's some rubric resources within here, uh, within the slide deck. For example, TCEA has some templates of using Google and self-reported grades. So we've got, if you scroll down, there's some background information, but if you scroll down to where it says rubrics, uh, this is a Google Docs three level and four level rubric template. So depending on what it is that you're measuring, you might be measuring you know, connection to other topics or understanding of content or extension or details or communication collaborative, whatever it is that you're measuring, you can have three or four things. Um, and then this, this is an older article, but these templates are really good. So uh, we're still linking to it, but for example, it says Google is currently beta testing built in rubrics. So if you are using Google Classroom, there are there is a rubric creation tool uh, built into Google Classroom as well. So any assignment that you have, you can have a rubric attached to that. Uh, and any rubric that you create in Google Classroom, you can use and you can reuse uh, within different various assignments. Uh, so Definitely recommend checking out this resource and some of the other resources listed on the uh, on this slide in the presentation. Uh, if you're interested in using rubrics or thinking about how to assess some of those different creative and project based learning opportunities. Uh, so I'd like to take a few minutes. We have a we have a little over five minutes left. Uh, having reflection. So I used to think, but now I think. So this could be about assessments. It could be about Google Forms. It could be about creative assessments. So I'm already seeing Google Forms is now less scary and knowing what's available facilitates creative ideas. So just take a few minutes, share your thoughts. I used to think, but now I think. Ah, I used to think I needed to retype questions and answers, but now I know how to duplicate. I used to be intimidated by Google Forms, but now I'm more comfortable. I used to think there were some limitations to forms. So lots of options with forms. Hopefully you're, those of you that are, were maybe less comfortable are inspired to, to be more flexible and creative with forms. Yes, lots of different choices and options. 
And while you're formulating your reflections as well and sharing them in the chat, I do want to point out, so this idea of a, I used to think, now I think, comes from, and I can share this in the in the presentation as well, but the Project Zero, Harvard's Project Zero has a thinking routine toolbox. So these are really great opportunities for assessing uh, how students feel about an assignment or how they feel about a concept or topic. Uh, so these Project Zero uh, thinking routines are really great for reflection uh, during the learning experience. So you can definitely check that out as well. And I'll put that in the speaker notes. So I used to think, but now I think, let's see. You can be more resourceful in reusing assessments. Um, it can be also used as an assessment tool. Yes, not just a survey tool. It can be a quiz tool. It can be used for garnering student feedback and reflection. Ah, it can be used to individualize student needs. Yes. And that branching forms option is certainly a, uh, a way to personalize. Uh, and then also the idea of giving feedback based on incorrect, incorrect responses. Uh, using rubrics. Yes. And rubrics can be used regardless of what students artifacts are. Uh, where they're creating their artifacts. That's a great question. Can we do just Google Forms? We could have focused a whole hour on Google Forms. Uh, I did a, a workshop actually with three sessions on forms and sheets. Uh, this was sort of a, a highlight, an idea, uh, an idea generating and an inspiration, uh, sort of a, a highlight and overview, a taste, if you will, uh, when you have an hour in a large group, uh, I, I try to provide as many ideas as possible. So I'm seeing some interest in more about forms. That'd be great. While we're on the topic of generating feedback, uh, we do have a session feedback form for this session particularly. I know we have a few minutes left, so please feel free to continue sharing your reflection or if you have any remaining questions, uh, but I do wanna give you an opportunity to uh, access that feedback form as well. Yes, we could do a whole session on Google Classroom and rubrics too. <laughs> um, or Google, we could do a whole session on rubrics, whether that's Google Docs rubrics and Google Classroom rubrics. It could just be Google Classroom for assessment. It could be Google Forms and Sheets for assessment. There's a lot of options within Google Workspace for Education as far as um, being able to assess learners to measure student growth and progress, and then also to uh, provide opportunities for students to document the learning experience, even as they use some supplemental tools. So uh, feel free to take the last couple of minutes to answer any questions or fill out the feedback form. Uh, and thank you all for attending and participating today. It was great to hear from you and best of luck in this new school year. Uh, and thank you to Gail for sharing some of our other offerings on digital assessment. Thanks everyone. Zoom link.